there. But let's not um, wait any longer and dive right into the presentation. So Venice has already given an introduction and uh, I will not uh, tell you much more about it than other that I am a true circular economy enthusiast. And I believe that the circular economy really holds true uh, potential for sustainability, uh, which I would like to discuss with you today. So uh, maybe a quick side note about my company, Circuculture. So we have made it our mission to um, cultivate circular economy mindsets and talents through education and experiences. So before we dive into the circular economy, let's first have a look at what we have today, the linear economy. So in contemporary um, practices, um, it is often the case that resources get extracted to be then be manufactured into parts and um, products. They are then distributed to the consumer who then um, uses it or consumes it. And in the end, unfortunately, way too often, we have a big pile of waste. Circular economy works differently and um, has a logic where we try to reduce wastes um, to a maximum by introducing practices like recycling and other sustainable circular strategies. Uh, to give you a short definition on circular economy, circular economy is an economy without waste. Uh, it is a regenerative system that is based on closed material cycles uh, in which resources are always kept at highest value in order to minimize waste. But how do you maybe ask yourselves, can we get to the circular economy if today we have a completely uh, different way of operating in most companies? Now, many of you have probably already heard the creator of the three R, reduce, reuse, recycle, that has also made it into social media now more and more. But did you know that there are actually way more R's than the three R's that we know from maybe social media and other, um, and other uh, media. So today there are 10 R's <laughs> that are outlined in the scientific article and that you will learn more about if you uh, visit my elective on the introduction of circular economy. Now, since today there is not enough time to go into each of them in detail, I would still like to um, present to you um, this video of the UN Environment Program that explains the most important of these R strategies to you. So let's have a little look on that. Circularity keeps materials at their highest possible value throughout the value chain. Circularity builds upon eight value retention loops and one guiding principle of reduce by design. Let's look at each of these circular processes from the most impactful to the least. Users can minimize their impact on the planet through their consumption choices, such as refusing unnecessary products and reducing how much and how often we buy and reusing what we have for longer. When a product doesn't work anymore, its lifetime can be extended while minimizing impact and cost by repairing broken parts or defects refurbishing it to increase or restore its performance, or remanufacturing it to fix it in an industrial process to become as new again. At the end of the product's use phase, materials can be turned into something useful again. They can be repurposed into a unique product with a new functionality, or they can be recycled to provide materials for creating new products. These eight circular processes can be impactful only if the overall principle of reduce by design is applied. Design influences the full life cycle of materials, products and services by requiring less raw material during production and use and anticipating their lifetime extension and their sound disposal at the end of use. Circularity is the breakthrough we need Learn more about circularity by visiting unet.org slash circular. 
circularity. <laughs> so now that you have gained an overview of this um, important concept and nine of the 10 R strategies, um, I would like to uh, take this a step further with you. Um, just a little side note. So this was one of the models that is quite uh, common. There are uh, many other models um, that all look a bit different, but have all the same message. So before we think about throwing away something or recycling something, we should take all of these other strategies that come before that so that we can extend the product's life cycles and uh, make best use of the resources that are inherent in it. And so now today, um, I would like to uh, show you some of the strategies, how businesses can make use of that while still making money. Because as we have also um, seen in the panel discussion earlier on, uh, companies have the um, fundamental uh, yeah, challenge that they have to operate sustainably while still remaining profitably. And so here, circular business models can come in quite handy. And I will focus the rest of this presentation mainly on product service systems. So many of you have probably heard something like product as a service. Now, what does this mean? So here we have an overview of the spectrum between products on this side, where the company only sells a product and nothing else, and services at the other side, where the respective company only sells a service. However, there's lots in between, and that is what we call product service systems. We mainly have three categories of product service systems. Um, we call them product-oriented, use-oriented, and result-oriented. And the further um, to the right that we go, the more we actually sell a service and not a product. So what does this mean? And please allow me to give you some examples. Or first, the definition of a product service system. So it's a business model that aims to create value by bridging the boundaries between selling physical products and providing services. So what does a product-oriented product service system mean? So here, the customer still owns the product, but he gets additional services by the company. What well, use-oriented product service systems, the product is rented by the customer, so it actually still belongs to the company that has produced it. But um, yeah, the service is basically the usage of the product in this case. And in the result-oriented product service system, the, only the result is sold. So it is really taken off of the product. And um, yeah, so what does this mean? So product-oriented would mean, um, for example, that with the product, the customer receives some sort of consulting or maintenance. Here in the Black Forest, we have a lot of companies that manufacture machines and other industrial goods. So obviously, they might come with an installation or with regular checkups and maintenance. Um, there are also some cases where the service is that there is a regular delivery of consumables for the respective product. And here I have an example for you of uh, the company Dan Tech. They manufacture da, uh, Bob, which is a small dishwasher, and the consumable that is delivered, which is the service in this case, are the um, cartridges that contain the uh, biodegradable um, soap or dishwashing liquid. So there they have a service, and that is one example. Then uh, for the use-oriented, we have three different subtypes. So we have leasing that you all know from cars, for example. So here, the respective user can own the product for a specific um, period of time, and it goes then back to the manufacturing company to then be sold to another user. On the second place, we have sharing or rental services. Um, so here, we do have a, se a sequential use of the product, um, but it is not so defined as in the leasing. And then we have pooling, which is a simultaneous use. Now let me explain this to you by um, giving you another example, which is the car. So leasing, we all know the model. Sharing or rental with the sequential use might be something like Drive Now or Miles or other car sharing services that we have in the cities where you can just go to a car and then basically use it for the time that you need it and afterwards it goes to another um, user. And then we have pooling. Now in this case of the car, the simultaneous use of the car 
what would it be? It would be the bus <laughs> that you have in the city because there we have one product, which is the bus, that is simultaneously used by many different um, persons. So now the last category of our product service systems are result oriented. So here as major strategies, we have outsourcing. So basically <laughs> giving the whole activity to another company or what is very interesting in terms of circular economy, pay per service use unit. So the user no longer buys the product, but only the output. Now, what does that mean? So we have here the example of Xerox managed print services. So so, um, you know, there used to be the case where companies or maybe institutions uh, like the HFU would buy copying machines and then they would yeah, just have them to be used forever. However, especially when we think about companies, companies, they usually have a business model that is focused on a specific thing and they, you know, like to focus on that specific thing. They do not want to you know, have to deal with buying a copying machine, maybe maintaining it, keeping it at best use. What they want is that their employees have the printouts. And so this is the logic that is pursued here because now Xerox has a service where they say, basically, you pay us per copy printed and we take care of all the rest. And there's another example with Philips, the same. If you think of office buildings, the company managing the, um, or that is basically having its workforce there, doesn't necessarily want to take care of exchanging light bulbs and buying them and all of that. It wants to focus on its business. So what Philips now also um, um, proposes, especially for large buildings and industrial complexes, is light as a service. So this means the customers only get charged for the number of hours that they have light in the building. And uh, here again, Philips takes care of all the rest. They exchange the light bulbs, they make the installation, they make sure everything runs so that the customer always gets what he really wants, which is light for its, empl uh, for its employees to be able to work. So here are some examples. And since we're in the Black Forest, I would also like to give another example. Just when you come into Schwenning and you see Helios, a uh, manufacturer of uh, fans. So here they, if thinking forward, could also employ such a strategy by having maybe air as in service because what is really what the people want that buy the fans of Helios? They want to have a clean air, I guess, or just like a proper air uh, conditioning. And so these are some examples of product service system. And now the question is, why am I talking about uh, product service systems? Why is this so important for circular economy? And I will show you because the major factor here is that it leads to a change of incentives. With the product-oriented business model, we see that when you sell one product, you get the corresponding amount of money. When you sell three products, you get three times the money. That's for sure. Now with the service oriented business model, it's different because when we sell or when the product is used one time, we get a specific amount of money. And when the same product, think about the car, is used by different users, you get more money by having just one resource, the same type of resources. Or let's think about the example that I gave with the light. Now, there's an interesting story back from um, the time when Germany was still divided into Eastern and Western Germany. So uh, in Eastern Germany, there was a manufacturer of light bulbs that then went to Western Germany to a trade fair. And he showed around his product and his innovation saying, oh, look at my light bulb. It's so per it's perfect. It does not break. You will only only need to buy one and it will last for 30 or 40 years. And his competitors from Western Germany laughed at him and said, why would you want to have such a product that, own, that you can only buy one time in 30 to 40 years? And that is also why we have plant obsolescence in so many cases today, because companies still need, in many cases, to sell products to remain profitable. And so, yes, yeah, so thinking about the light bulbs and taking this example to the current uh, situation of Philips, now they have an incentive to exchange the light bulbs 
as little as possible because they get paid by the hour, not by the amount of light bulbs. So what they would like is to reduce their costs to a maximum, is to reduce the times that an employee has to go to a company and exchange a light bulb or like the material that is used in the light bulbs to a maximum. And that is the power of product service systems with respect to sustainability, because in service-oriented business models, we turn consumables into cost factors, like for example, the light bulbs and so on. And thereby we incentivize resource saving. And um, with this, I am at the end of my presentation. I hope this has given you some food of thought. And um, besides the questions that we have here, I would also also like you to think about one other question. So now, you know, I've praised service, uh, product service systems to you. Now, are they really sustainable? And we will get back to that also at the end of our session. And um, for now, I thank you very much and just give you some more info if you would like to take this further. So there's this uh, report, Circular Business Models. Um, Overcoming Barriers Unleashing Potentials, which is a very good report by the Circular Economy Initiative Germany. And for those of you who take my elective, we will go into that in much more detail because besides the product service systems that I have shown you now, there are approximately 40 different circular economy business models that you can then employ for companies and that can be strategies to operate more sustainably. And um, for those of you who speak German, I also warmly invite you to take a, a look or listen to my podcast, uh, which is in German that will teach you much more about circular economy.